Rain moving southwards overnight, lows of minus one. Rain moving into the far north tomorrow, patchy rain for the southeast of England with a high of eight Celsius. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Charlotte Morgan. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. One minute past eight is the time. Welcome to Wednesday's Cross Question. I'm Ian Dale. Uh, let me tell you who's on our panel tonight. To my left, we have Shalina Jan Mohammed, writer and host of the Global Original Podcast, The Shalina Show, which you can find on Global Player. She'll tell us all about that uh, in a few minutes' time. Uh, to her left is Stephen Hammond, Conservative MP for Wimbledon, a former Vice Chairman of the Party, former Health Minister. To my right, Cindy Yu, Assistant Editor of The Spectator and the host of the Chinese Whispers podcast. And John John Trickett is Labour MP for Hemsworth, former member of Jeremy Corbyn's Shadow Cabinet. Well, there are so many things that you might want to call in about. We've been talking about one of them, uh, the case that Shamid Begum has lost in court. That's going to be our first question, I think. But do phone in on anything else that takes your fancy. The number to call 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 and you can use Alexa to submit your question. Just say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC and then just say your question. Ooh. And... Uh, uh, oh, that's, uh, John's very excited about <laughs> well, the Alexa impressed. questions. Um, luckily, John, you can't see the screen. I see all the questions on here, and no. believe me, some of the Alexa comments you would, would make you happy. <laughs> yeah, if, uh, if I had any. Cindy yeah. has the pleasure of uh, looking at those. Right, you can also, of course, watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first question. It's from Jack in Canterbury. Hello, Jack. Hello. What would you like to ask? Right, my question is, is it worrying that the Shamima Begum incident might set a precedent, precedent that the Home Office can revoke the citizenship of anyone they want? John Trickett. Well, look, first of all, we don't know the exact detail of uh, what happened in court because some of it was held, I think, in private. And as, look, there are two points, I think, about the nature of the state and its relationship to citizens. The first is, maybe the most important, we have to have a state which protects our security, our well-being and the nation as a whole. The second thing, and it's very important, and especially to be, we're proud to be British, is to protect the rights of the individual. And what I would say is, Nobody from whatever region, origin they come from or any religion or, or sexuality or gender or any other thing should be discriminated against so that the rights of each one of us is the same as the rights of every one of us. And in this case, what we have is a woman who was born, I understand, and grew up here, spent all her life here until 15, and the Home Secretary seems to have had the power to remove her citizenship. As I said, we haven't seen the detail, but... It does beg the question, are we sending a signal to people all over our country that their citizenship can be revoked without an adequate explanation, at least through the courts? I suppose my final point is this. We have to trust the judge. The judge would have seen all the evidence, and I guess, I guess that they've taken a balanced view. But you need to balance those two different aspects. Uh, presumably, I'm trying to remember back at the time that the Home Secretary at the time, Sajid Javid, made mm. the decision on national security grounds. Mm. Now... A Home Secretary is never going to give the detail of that, yeah. but he was concerned enough to do it. Um, a, a subsequent Home Secretary, I think, did the same with so-called Jihadi Jack, yeah. who is also a British yeah. citizen. Because some people are saying, Tim Farron said on the News Agents podcast tonight, that if Shamima had been white, mm. this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Now, the fact that Jihadi Jack it happened to, who yeah. was white, rather, yeah. rather disproves that, I suppose. Cindy you, what's your view on this? I'm afraid that um, Jack in Canterbury is, I think hit the nail on the head about why this case is so worrying. As a first-generation immigrant, someone who is not white, I would like to think that I'm British. Legally, I am British. And I'm never going to go join a terrorist group. But even if I... Thanks for the reassurance. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the point is this should not be down to um, a Home Secretary to revoke that citizenship when Shamima Begum has no other alternative yeah. citizenship. If you trace back her ancestry... Well, apparently she did at the time. I don't think she, I, I, as well I understood it, she could have applied for Bangladeshi citizenship at the time, but she didn't have it. But that's not the same. That's true. Anyone can apply. I mean, if you trace back to ancestry, I mean, that we very quickly get very into racist, shaky grounds there um, for anyone who's 
parents or grandparents weren't from this country or I wasn't even born in this country. So what does that mean for my mm. citizenship? I think if it was national security that we were worried about, we should have brought her back and put her in prison and charged her and put her through all of that process. And actually, I think... Preferably charged her before you put yes, her in prison. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually think is the the very fact that we've left her there is actually because she is not a massive threat. If she was an active ISIS fighter out there still fomenting discord, we would have had her back and but, we would have locked her up. But that, that, that is a suspicion that, that, that she is still committed to the ISIS cause and therefore if she did come back, okay, she would be locked up on, on remand before the, the court yeah. case, but she could try and radicalise people in prison. I suppose that's the argument that would be I put. I mean, we have, we have extremists in prison already. I mean, we, we lock them up, right? We can't just ship them out to other mm. countries anyway as a solution. Um, and also, some of the comments that she's made, you know, I've seen this kind of discourse, but she's in a refugee camp where there are still other ISIS wives, other I, former ISIS fighters, I don't think her situation is safe enough for her to, you know, come out and completely disclaim ISIS. You know, that's the situation. I mean, people die in those camps all the time. There's violent crime, children barely grow up. And I think it's awful, frankly. And I think Jack hits, on, hits the nail on the head that citizenship shouldn't be a political tool like this. Mm. Shalina. This is a story that seems to have really captured our darkest imagination for the last few years. And it's I think it's because it brings together a lot of questions that we're debating. So what does it mean to be British? I mean, in this case, literally, what does it mean to be British? What does it mean for people who are of multiple heritages? And as Cindy was saying, does that mean that you go back a generation and actually you're not quite as British as somebody else because you've got some link to another country, even if you don't have their citizenship? So does that make you a second class citizen? And like Cindy, I worry for myself that, you know, if we've if we've got some link to another country, does that mean I'm less British than somebody else? Mm. But there's also questions around, you know, at what point do we treat children as adults? And we had the really horrific case of Rhiannon Rudd, who was a 14-year-old girl who was radicalised by the far right and who was taken under prevent and subsequently took her own life. And we treat her as a child and her mother had, had called for that to be treated in that way. So what's different between... Shamima Begum at 15 being radicalised and this terrible case of Rhiannon Rudd. So there are a lot of questions that I think have polarised in this story. And I think the truth is that we see Muslim women as, as a bogeyman, as, as somebody who kind of polarises all our darkest fears about society. And speaking as a Muslim woman, that's a terrifying thing to have to confront in society. Do you think it's also a classic example of something where people's initial reaction is to think with their heart rather than their head. And uh, I said on the programme earlier that when her face, f case first came up and I was talking about it on the radio, I took the attitude, well, let her rot in hell in Syria. We, we don't want her back here, thank you very much. But then when you actually think about all the different aspects of the case, you come to, well, I would hope that any rational thinking person would come to a very different conclusion. I've had one or two texts throughout the last hour saying, well, I'm, I'm glad you said that, Ian, because that was my reaction too, first of all. But I've thought about it. And I think we, we do have a duty to yeah. treat her exactly the same as we would any other British citizen. I think what we see in conversations about people who in quotation marks we call the other in this case muslim women is that those stereotypes and those conversations run really deep which is why we have those initial reactions so she must be guilty because that's what we've been primed to believe and that's uh, that's how we connect the ideas i mean i i have a very personal experience this when i when i launched the shalina show podcast the big headline in one of the papers was that I, Shalina, would talk to Shamima Begum. And I thought, well, where did that relationship come from? Like, I, I don't understand. I talk about the well, news. Sim similar name, so you must do. Well, the journalist who interviewed <laughs> me actually did call me Shamima oh, in really? the interview, oh, no. which I kind of went... <gasps> <sighs> um, but it, it's that idea that somehow it's all connected and all yeah. you know Muslims or all other people but are frankly, the same. And as a journalist, who wouldn't want to talk to her? I mean, if, if I got the chance to interview her, I would want to interview her. Mm -hmm. That's right. We all want to tell really great stories, but there's something about we connect up that if you're a, a Muslim woman, you must be a terrorist, therefore another Muslim woman, guilt by yeah. association, when actually <coughs> everybody has lots of different stories. And you're right, once you get past that and you say, well, actually, she was 15, she was a child, how should we react to that? We're how does that fit into the conversation about grooming and radicalisation? And if there is a silver lining to this conversation, maybe that's it, that we can take a breath and go really interrogate our own our own stereotypes and our own prejudices about it. Um, Stephen Hammond, you were a government minister at this time, not, not in the Home Office, I don't think. But just thinking back to then, when you heard what the Home Secretary decided to do, 
Were you concerned at all or, or were you given any information as to why he had made this decision? Um, no, I was a minister in a different department, so um, you, go, you don't get the ins and outs. Um, you do, as a minister, get the chance to read cabinet briefing papers, as you know, and cabinet papers under official secrets. You saw publicly what uh, the Home Secretary at the time said, which is that if anyone knew what he knew, yeah. And he'd make you would also make that same decision, but what we're talking about here, which is a bit tantalising, isn't it? Well, it is, and it's it plays into the point John was making is that you know we haven't heard it entirely what the judge has said. Nonetheless, the discussion here, which is the interesting discussion, I guess, is which is you know every citizen of the United Kingdom should have the same rights, yeah. whatever you are. The question is, <clears throat> have those same rights been exercised in the same way here? Do they have implications for others? What goes with those rights in terms of responsibility and also um, what exactly is the you know where does the age of majority take effect um, because this obviously was someone who was 15 at the time now clearly it wasn't a spontaneous decision uh, just to go to overseas to join an ISIS terrorist camp whether she was radicalized whether she did Alpha in that only you would find that if you spoke to her but none the, nonetheless you know clearly that was a, a predetermined action and you know, whether at 15 you have the you know, the real um, capability or intellectual or at times, sh shall we say, moral capacity because of the threat it might make to others um, to make that decision. And should we have taken a greater account of that in at the time of that decision-making process? Shalina, what, what do you make of what Stephen said? In terms of the, the citizenship issue? Or, um, I mean, I, I think... I think uh, the relationship of the state with the individual, as you've, both, you've all talked about before, is really important. And we as a nation are responsible for our citizens. So in yep. the case of Shamim Begin, she was born here. She was brought up here. Her connection to another country, in this case Bangladesh, is tenuous at best. She didn't have citizenship at all. And therefore, we should be responsible for our citizens and what happens to them. And I think the mark of a mature state is that we take responsibility for the great heroes we have, but also when things go wrong, that we address that and we don't kind of ship it out to but, some other country. Uh, exactly, and I agree entirely with that. The only question here, of course, is did the individual choose uh, not to become a British citizen by the actions they took? Were they effectively disowning their British citizenship? I mean, you could and, and then, treason, and, I suppose, couldn't you? In, in, well, then you, there'd be other ways of doing it. But, I mean, this isn't someone... I mean, there, there, this is an extreme case... Um, but you could say that this was someone who was um, almost disowning and dis, you know, dis abusing her British citizenship because she chose to take the action she did. And that's a, another something we can't ever be absolutely clear about. But maybe she was disowning the heritage here for her heritage elsewhere. Do, do, John, do you think that um, a future Labour government should look at maybe clarifying this? I think that there, is, there are proposals to change the laws on treason, but maybe there needs to be a much wider shake-up so everybody understands exactly the consequences of their actions. Well, making law on the base of individuals is a terrible thing to do. <laughs> so let's just say that, first of all. We have to have universal principles at the point in trying to make at the beginning, which apply to all of us equal, equally. Whatever our origins, origin, our antecedents, my uh, my antecedents came from, were well, Jewish and came from uh, Poland. Um, so we have to, you know, this needs to be done in a universalistic way. So what I think, there's a lot of legislation that has been taken really on the hoof, often in relation to an individual case, that is a f terrible mistake to make. And I think uh, our two uh, guests here have made the point clearer than I have, you know, the would it have happened to a, a, a white woman from a middle class background that her her uh, citizenship would have been removed. Well, it, it so happened I don't think to it a white man from well, a middle class did. background. Well, didn't it, it did, but it did, but that's not the question I'm asking. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I think look, this is this is a difficult thing. Um, as I said, the state does have responsibility for all our security and safety, but that should not be at the expense of an individual's, um, you know, human rights as a British citizen. And that's where I think most people would stand when they reflect on it. Okay. Well, Jack, you certainly provoked a good discussion there. Thank you very much for the question. Keep your calls coming 0345 6060 973 uh, We are going to talk about the Northern Ireland Protocol mm. next. What could possibly go wrong? It's quarter past eight. <laughs> this is LBC.
Past eight is the time. John Trickett, Labour MP, Cindy Yu from The Spectator, Stephen Hammond, Conservative MP, and Shalina Jan Mohammed is with us, uh, the host of The Shalina Show. Now, I think it sounds like quite show-busy, Shalina. What, what's it all about? I was going for that kind of glamour <laughs> thing, but actually it's about news and current affairs, so I talk to... So you're trying to compete with me, that's what you're saying. <laughs> Nobody could compete Thank with you. Thank you. Oh, good answer. <laughs> but I, I could come a close second, but... <laughs> Um, so the idea of the show is to get people on to spend a little bit more time unpacking some of the big headlines and looking at different perspectives. So, so far we've talked to people like Dan Snow and what he's thought about Windrush and about um, Nepo Babies, which was quite Excuse me? A Nepo Baby, that started off as a, a Hollywood trend where children of celebs would get a leg up, but it's become a wider social trend talking about people who have connections into usually the creative industry. So he's a Nepo Baby I'm not a Nepo baby, so we had quite a good conversation. Yeah, we, we're both here. That's why you're number one and I'll, I'll be a close <laughs> second. Um, but then we also talk about some of those subjects that seem to just go straight past us in the news so we can get a bit more depth. So this week I've been talking about what does it mean to be British, which feels very timely. We've spoken about being a sandwich generation carer, which is one in three people in the UK. So that's people like me who look after their parents and their mm. children. Mm poverty about striking so if you want to get some depth about what's going on in the news you can get a quick 20 mm. minute primer there or tune into ian dale in the evening monday to thursday <laughs> 7 p.m or on, listen on to the shalina show and knock ian off his top so you can you subscribe to the <laughs> shalina show uh, on global player right let's move on to our next question it's jerry in whitley bay hello jerry good evening Ian. good evening panel hello um, should Hi. keir starmer be offering support for a new Brexit deal for Northern Ireland when no one but Rishi Sunak and the EU know what the deal is yet, or even if there is a deal. That, that's a really interesting question. I was listening to Keir Starmer on the Matt Ford Political Party podcast on the train home last night, and he was Keir Starmer was absolutely straight down the line, yep, we will support it. And I remember, like you, Jerry, thinking, well, that's a bit odd when you don't actually know what's in it. Um, his, his basis for doing that, John Trickett, was, sorry to come to you for the second time um, first, was that, well, he needs to save Rishi Sunak from the ERG, and so... Labour votes can get this through Parliament. I'm not even sure it actually needs to go to a vote, does it? I think it may not need a vote. It was interesting today to... I'm trying to avoid the subject here, but <laughs> to, listen to, uh, to listen to the Prime Minister saying, well, we we should listen to what the House of Commons says, or worse to that effect. He didn't actually say there would be a vote. Well, look, uh, leaders of parties um, take positions all of the time which are intended to speak to the wider... I suppose, zeitgeist. And the truth is that the Conservative Party made a complete mess of both Brexit, and but especially of what happened in Northern Ireland. They hadn't thought it through properly, and clearly someone's going to have to clean up the mess. So I can understand the Labour leadership, who I don't speak for, by the way, as you know, um, uh, wanting to say that we will help to clear this mess up. It's a mess which you made... That's speaking to the Conservative Party, and it needs to be resolved because there's clearly a problem there. I was going to say, you can't hold me responsible for it. Not, not you personally, Thank no. goodness for that. No. Um, Stephen Hammond, this is obviously a really important issue, the Northern Ireland Protocol, and if Rishi Sunak can pull this off, I mean, this will be a major achievement, but we were expecting it to be all announced yesterday, and it wasn't. What do you put that down to? And then we'll come on to the original question from Jerry. Um, I put that down to the sense at the moment that I think the, the last bits of politics have to be put together. Um, John's point and your point that anyone would want to read it before they uh, commit to it, it's true, but broadly speaking, uh, we have a fairly clear yeah. idea of what this deal is going to look like. Yeah. Green and red lanes, uh, a mediation process which, if it fails, will then potentially go to an ECJ or to a UK court, and some discussion about <coughs> goods going from Northern Ireland to uh, the UK. Um, uh, sorry, to GB. And and so um, we know the broad shape of it, which is why Starmer uh, Sakir was able to say what he said last night, I'm sure. Um, I think that the Prime Minister will pull it off, and I think he'll pull it off for a number of reasons, which is that, first of all, um, there are a number of people who are really interested in this and therefore have a view. There are some of my colleagues who feel it's important to show their Brexit ideological purity. Yep. Um, and I think some of them are going to have to realise fairly quickly that not only is the sort of 
if, if, if the deal is right, is going to be good for both UK and Northern Ireland business, but is in our greater UK national interest in that it will start to unlock, enable us to have constructive relationships with our nearest neighbours, which we need to have. No one is, you know, we, you know, th my party, uh, and actually the whole, because uh, although John says that the Tories need to own the mess, um, let's just remember how Corbyn behaved and how certain things could have been done a lot better for the overall national interest uh, and Mr Corbyn's behaviour over some of the discussions and some of us bear the scars of those um, meant that a better deal was not secured more quickly. But in the wider UK interest, it is absolutely clear to me that if we um, can agree a deal on the Northern Ireland Protocol and it being in the interest of Northern Ireland business and UK interest, it will also unlock things in terms of potentially mutual recognition in financial services in certain areas. I think it will open up a better discussion on how we might look at some of the, the other wider tariff issues. I think actually for all those people who are complaining about immigration, the chance of a better Anglo-French summit on March the 10th and therefore a discussion about small boats and how we look at the immigration could well be unlocked by so doing you this as well. So I think all of those things are being held up because of the lack of an agreement on the Northern Ireland Protocol? Well, I think that they are... Undoubtedly, the mood music has got significantly better over the last six months and uh, we have more construction. But absolutely, I think um, the tension over the Northern Ireland Protocol and the inability to have a discussion means that other discussions didn't take place. And I think it is pretty well, pretty clear to me personally that if you are having a more harmonious relationship on one of the most contentious issues, that it's likely you're going to have a more harmonious and productive relationship on other well, issues. Well, I'm aware that we don't have any Northern Irish politicians on the panel tonight, but we will have next week, well, I say we will have, I'm off next week, but Ben Kentish will be hosting the programme, and I know Claire Hanna from the... Um, mm. It is the SDLP, SDLP. isn't it? SDLP. <laughs> nearly, yes. said, nearly said Alliance for a moment. <laughs> um, she will be on the programme, and I think we've got another one as well. Um, Shirley, what do you make of this? <clears throat> so, so, as a non-politician on this panel, I think my observation is that, you know, we had the referendum in 2016, and here we are in 2023, and what should have been a, an issue that was addressed in that preliminary conversation is still kind of carrying on. And... You know, it's also the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement this year. And actually, as, as a sort of layperson, the non-politician, it's about securing that peace, but also having a sense of who we are as a nation and the trajectory we're travelling on. You know, one minute there is a border down the sea and the next minute we, you know, we want to have free movement with Ireland and then, you know, separately we don't know what's happening with Scotland. So what I'm hoping for is that... We don't have politicians kind of, you know, having a fight about this. And sorry, Stephen, it did sound a bit like, you know, a bit of criticism over here and a bit of that politician doing that. I think we need some leaders to be able to set our country on a trajectory that feels like we're going in a direction. But do you feel Rishi Sunak has done that? Because, of course, Liz Truss and Boris Johnson had, had their bill, which were the Northern... I can't remember what it's called, Stephen, you, you know, the, the Northern Ireland... Well, the Northern Ireland Protocol bill. Yeah. Protocol, yeah. Um, and that was a sort of sort meant to be a kind of sort of Damocles hanging over these discussions, which would encourage, in inverted commas, the EU to come to a deal. Now, Rishi Sunak has basically put that on pause and has adopted a very different negotiating stance. Do you think that's been a good thing? I think securing the peace and getting us to move forward has to be a good thing because otherwise, you know, what I do agree with Stephen is it does feel like we're stuck and we're not moving anywhere forward. So I think in that sense, it has to be a good thing. I think it, it sometimes just feels like, to be honest, the politicians are all kind of having a bit of a wrangle for themselves and it's not very clear as a nation what that means for us and, and how that gets us to the objective that we're going to. So if we've got Brexit, how, how does that help us move forward? I mean, a, a wider observation I have, and I'll be really honest about this, is that I wasn't taught anything about Northern Ireland at school or Ireland or the Union or Scotland or anything. So when these discussions have come up, you know, and I'm hoping I'm not alone in this, otherwise I've just embarrassed myself on national <laughs> radio, is is this very hard to understand what mm. we're trying to get to? And it does feel like, certainly sitting in London, and I'm born and brought up here, that Northern Ireland is the poor cousin and we haven't really embraced it and made it part of the family and made us think about it, it as a, a union and as part of the nation that we care about as much as every other region. 
And also, we don't understand any of the history of the Republic of Ireland, how it came to be, and all of that. And um, I'm hoping that a new podcast that I'm hosting starting uh, Monday oh, week. Very on the, smooth, yeah, I know. It's, yeah. it's, it's called a Radio Link. <laughs> and he's going um, straight all the way back to Cromwell. And it's called, be on no, I'm line. not. It's yeah, called the Irish. To, if you want to understand Ireland. It's called the Irish T-shirt, <laughs> if I can get the words out, Stephen. Um, and it's basically 15 podcasts about the 15 men who've served in, in the office of Irish T-shirt. And I have learned so much about Irish history by quizzing all of the different academics about the different Taoiseach. That's the plural of oh, Taoiseach, right. by the way. Mm. You've well, learned something, something new tonight, John. Evening, yeah. um, anyway, enough of that. Cindy. <laughs> Flexing a bit there, Ian. <laughs> What's your answer to, Ger- to Jerry? Should Keir Starmer be vowing to support this new Brexit deal for Northern Ireland? I think he should, for the reasons that Stephen have set out. We, we roughly know what's going to be in there um, in terms of the green and red lanes, in terms of the ECJ. You know, we don't know the details, details. But we also know that if a deal like this goes through, Stormont comes back online as long as the DUP is happy with it, which is obviously a question mark. Um, but, you know, the fact is that Northern Ireland hasn't had a governing body for a year. And if this deal fixes that, then that will be a good thing for the people of Northern Ireland. Um, I, I agree with so much of what's been said on the panel already. I mean, I watched Derry Girls over the Christmas period, which I felt was a bit of a beginner's guide. <laughs> um, I have to say, I haven't done that. Yeah, that. It's, maybe I should. Well, maybe, you should, maybe, maybe you're more expert now. But, um, but uh, I think, you know, with the playing politics, so much of this, especially on the backbenches in the Conservative Party, you know, when Boris Johnson says, oh, I'm minded, or allies of Boris Johnson say that he's minded to go public with his reservations about the deal. Well, Boris Johnson was one of the leading campaigners for Brexit in 2016 <coughs> and 2015. He didn't talk about Northern Ireland very much. And to the extent that people at that point talked about it was all about technology. Boris Johnson then was the architect of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which the DUP felt backstabbed that he pushed through. So now for him on the backbenches to come and say, this is not good enough. Well, the only thing I think is that, you know, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill could have been a good sort of Damocles. It still could be, and I'm not sure if Rishi Sunak is right to shelf that. But at the same time, I don't see any better ideas coming from the Boris Johnson camp, and it does feel like politicking. Stephen, do you have some pithy words of advice for Boris Johnson? Uh, I think that former Prime Ministers should think very carefully about intervening into uh, the modern which, political arena. Translate, so John, translated, dear listener, that means shut the F up doesn't it? Well, you put it in a, a, such a charming way. Well, if that would apply to Mr Blair as well, it might well do. <laughs> apply to Mr Corbyn too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, right, I should well, mention, by the way, if you want to way. subscribe to the Irish T-shirt yeah. podcast, you can do so on Global Player. Uh, and T-shirt is spelled T I. T A O I S E A C H. Yes, I have got that, was that a right. Name there. And just a recommendation: if you want to educate yourself on the history of the Republic of Ireland, there is a brilliant series on Netflix called Rebellion, and it goes through the events of the Easter Rising mm-hmm. and the Civil War. And it, it is a drama; it's, it's it's not a sort of documentary. But I, I probably learnt more about that than I ever have by reading mm. any books on it. So uh, have a watch of that if you get time. It's eight thirty-two on LBC. Uh, half an hour more of your calls on cross question 0345 6060 973 news headlines with charlotte morgan shamima begum will not be allowed to return to the uk after losing her latest legal case against the government she was 15 when she ran away to syria to join the so-called islamic state her lawyers say they'll appeal the decision the way Lancashire Police handled the disappearance of Nicola Bully is facing a review. The College of Policing will look at how they released personal information to the public. Four supermarkets are now rationing fresh produce after shortages because of supply problems. Poor harvests in Spain and North Africa has led to Tesco, Aldi, Asda and Morrisons, limiting the amount of certain products which can be bought by customers. LBC weather, a few showers in the far north of Scotland, patchy rain moving south overnight with a low of minus one. This is LBC. This.
Eight thirty-six. John Trickett, Cindy Yu, Stephen Hammond, and Shalina Jan Mohammed are with me, taking your calls. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Corey, my producer, just put on the screen uh, with this amount of plugs. It's sounding like QVC. Uh, Cindy Yu, let's plug your podcast, uh, Chinese Whispers. That's yep. what it says on the tin, I guess. Yep. Um, it is all it's more factual than your, your, your average game of Chinese whispers. I try to bring uh, the China that I know and love. I was born in China. I was there for the first 10 years of my life um, to the British audience. Um, so going beyond the headlines of just what we normally read about Hong Kong or surveillance or anything else, although those are topics are touched as well. But for my, for example, my latest episode is about rock music in China and how it came about as a mm. genre after the Cultural Revolution, splicing in a bit of the head-banging tracks in there. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to listen to that on my way home. I'm trying as, to... as well as Shalina's podcast <laughs> as well. At the same time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, one, one in each year. <laughs> so I'm trying to, trying to flesh out China as the country that I know and love because it's about so much more than just the dictatorship. Okay, when, when you look at the history and the size of China, it, it is a scandal, actually, that we don't know more about what is now effectively the world's second superpower. And it impacts the way that we talk about it, it impacts the way that we decide policy about it. You know, when we talk about Hong Kong during the protests, very few people knew, knew about the history of Hong Kong and between China and the UK. And that actually, for the Chinese, is f- first and foremost in their minds. So that when there's that gap in you know, your memories about what happened in, in history, that is where miscommunications happen. And I think that's partly why our relations with China are so bad at the moment. Obviously, also partly because of the <laughs> person in power in China at the moment. But yes, I mean, I think just trying to bring a bit more um, of that background knowledge. OK, right. Let's move on to another question. It's from Martin in Doncaster. Hello, Martin. Hello, Ian and panel. Yeah, my question is, is if Labour win the next election, will we scrap voter ID and should it be forced for the local elections? I'm not going to come to John Trickett first because okay. I have done for the first two <laughs> questions. Um, Shalina, let's come to you first on this. It's, it's quite a controversial issue, isn't it? Voter ID. So I was always brought up with the idea that one of the great privileges of being British was that you could walk down the street and nobody could demand your papers or to be identified. That was what I was always told was was fantastic. And in every election that I voted for, and I have gone to every election, both the general and the local ones. Quite right, too. Um, you know, I've turned up and I've gone, yeah, that's my name. Shalina Jan Mohammed is quite an unusual name, so I'm just looking for the long one. <laughs> and uh, and they hand me my ballot paper and I go in the booth and I get the pencil and I do the little X thing and, uh, and away we go. And as far as I can tell from all the reports, the amount of voter fraud has been minimal, mm. negligible. So I think there is a question about... You know, what is the problem we're trying to solve and does it make a bigger problem <coughs> if people can't vote um, because of the voter ID requirement? Whether in the future, because we're becoming digitalised and we have all of our information online, we should consider a new kind of digital ID. I think that's a separate conversation and brings up issues around data integrity, safety, protection, what happens if, you know, what happens to that data and who owns it. But at the moment, to me, it seems like, you know, voter ID was fixing a problem that wasn't broke. Apparently there are uh, two million people who don't have a valid form of ID, which I must admit is a figure I I would question. But anyway, only 21,300 people have signed up for the government's voter authority certificate so far. The Lib Dems have asked for the introduction of compulsory voter ID to be delayed because it is going to be implemented for this May's local elections. But the government have said no. Um, But it has been a legal requirement in Northern Ireland since 2002. I have to say, I don't recall a huge groundswell of opinion in Northern Ireland against it. But Stephen, this is going to be a big issue. If um, turnout in the local elections is even lower than it has been before, people are going to ask legitimate questions. They are. And actually, we're going right back, as Shalene just said, to our first discussion about the relationship between what makes a UK citizen, what are the rates with it, what should we expect? I think that it's, you know, on the whole, with one or two notable exceptions in the last 50 years, um, voter fraud has not been a problem. But we should, I mean, to recognise why did this ever come about, um, even if it is a um, a hammer to crack a nut, um, it came about because this is what the Electoral Commission actually recommended back in (coughs) 2014, that we should move towards this system. 1914? 2014. 2014. Yes. I was going to say. <laughs> no, I thought, I thought we were back on Ireland for a moment. <laughs> and the pre... Uh, no, but being serious, the... Um, so it, what, it hasn't come about because suddenly a government... It, 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 it started off because the Electoral Commission actually started with recommendations. Now, there is a real question. One, um, do we think that as a British citizen this is appropriate? You know, Two, 
uh, what problem is it trying to actually trying to solve? Uh, and three, will it actually disenfranchise people? I mean, most people, uh, a bit like you, I'm quite surprised uh, about you know the number of two million people that don't have some form of ID. Um, it seems that seems a very high number. Um, the government has obviously said to everybody, if you need ID, then we, you know we will provide the certificate. So um, the real question is, should we treat this uh, partially as an experiment to see what happens? I mean, I you know I don't know about you, Ian, but you well, know. we have done an experiment, and apparently it does depress uh, turnout. Yeah. I mean, that, that, there was a trial of this. I, I don't know where it was, but not that long ago. But, I mean, on, on election day, and I, I mean, I've been involved as an election agent and a candidate, and I can remember on each election that I was involved in, whether it was a local election or a general election, um, the local party office would get phone call after phone call from people saying they won't allow me to vote because they say somebody's voted in my place. Now... Shalina, when you say that, well, there's no evidence of widespread fraud, that's because there are very few cases, because the police, I mean, it's almost impossible to, to police. Now, do you get this in your constituency yeah. office? Do you get this, John, as well? I mean, you, no. You don't? No, no. Uh, and look, I've been, I've been active in the Labour Party since 1969, so that tells you how old I am. But uh, the number of times when somebody said, I've tried to vote and I couldn't, when we've pursued it, is tiny because one reason or another they've either changed their address or the polling booth has changed from one place to another and those kind of things happen look i mean we've got to be clear about this this is an attempt to suppress potential labor voters poorer voters younger voters and people who are mobile who, who don't have uh, a fixed address because they've moved maybe once or twice or younger people who you know are, and, and poorer people and we know that is the case, and I think it's a deliberate attempt to rig the election in favour of the Conservative Party. It will not work. It should not stand. The question was, should Labour remove it if we get into office? Well, I can't speak for the Labour Party, but I can speak for my view and the people I represent. And we're going to see voter suppression on a significant scale in my constituency, because there are people who have no, no means of readily identifying themselves, they need to be encouraged to vote because we should hear the, the voices of younger people. And why is it that a an older person's pass, as I was pointing out today, I've got one, uh, would allow me as an older person to, reg to identify myself, but a younger person mm. with the same pass will not be allowed to that, use that. that. that Stephen, is that, that is blatantly unfair, isn't it? Yeah, I don't, I don't buy John's initial argument, but making... No, but on that particular... But no, but I'm just about to agree with him that yeah. actually any form of ID which applies yeah. to one part of a citizen should apply to another. It's the whole point that you should be treated equally as a citizen. So there should be agreed and universal methods uh, of identifying yourself. And it shouldn't matter whether you're 18, uh, 48 or 88. 88. You know, and that... that you're not 18, so I agree. No, I'm not oh, quite. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with John on that point. I yeah, clearly don't agree with. Yeah. I clearly don't agree with him on the first point okay. because it came from the electoral not commission. Work, but Cindy um, Fraser Nelson, your editor, is constantly tweeting about this, and he's very anti this voter ID. Um, are you going to agree with him or the government? Um, I'm, I'm quite open-minded on this. I mean, I think I've heard some very interesting arguments, and I didn't, I didn't realise that it depressed turnout. I think that would be a damaging thing to do if there was a long-term impact of it. Well, in these trials, it did. I think yeah. in Northern Ireland, it is. Well, I just I wonder how much of it. Different. I just wonder how much of it is a transitional issue. You know, how much have we, have we got the message out that you need an ID? How much have we got the message out that it's easy to get an ID? For, the, for example, there's two million. I don't think we should just throw our hands up and say two million people in this country will never get IDs, you know, no matter the circumstance. We can obviously, the government can obviously put the message forward to encourage that. So I don't think any of these are arguments um, or inherent arguments not to do this. Fraser Nelson is very anti this because he believes in civil liberties, he, he doesn't believe in the government having all of this data in one place, especially a government that has, let's face it, in the past had data security problems. Um, my personal view and on the suggestions of such people like William Haig and Tony Blair today of putting all of this data in one place, it's actually, you know, the government already has this data. You know, it has our NHS data, it has our driving licences, it has our addresses, um, all of these things, right, and private companies do too. So if we're going to just make the whole system a bit more fluid, flow a bit better, sooner or later I do think they're going to be in one place a digital ID, not necessarily for voting, that's a, almost a separate question, but I do think we shouldn't necessarily resist ID just because we fear that inherently it will be a fear towards um, civil li liberty erosion. I just don't think that's, 
yeah, necessarily follows. Sorry, but, phrases this, listening. <laughs> well, if I can just make one, yes, one the, <laughs> make clear the, one, the point I wanted to make, which is this: that for a democracy to work properly, every single section of the population needs to be broadly represented when they come to vote. But we know that voter ID hits people in a differential way according to the social or demographic group. And we know, for example, younger people tend not to have uh, ID. Now, it can't be right that we're setting up a system which prevents younger people from voting in the numbers which they would otherwise do, and that therefore older people would have a larger weight in how they vote. And it's hard to avoid the conclusion that there is some party advantage in this, but put that to one side. Is it right that we're going to set up a system which precludes certain groups within the population from voting? Okay, um, yeah. Kerry says everyone in the UK over the age of 15 and three months has a national insurance number and that's an ID. Thank you. End of discussion. I'm not sure it is the end of discussion yeah, because there isn't a photo on, on your national, no, exactly. uh, on your NI number. And um, possibly this is the most innovative suggestion <coughs> from Bob the White Van Man who mm. says, should not the voter ID be upgraded to a conservative party membership card. <laughs> I'll leave that thought with you. It's 8.47. LBC. LBC, this is going to be a plug-free quarter with John Trickett, Cindy Yu, Stephen Hammond, Angelina Jan Mohammed. Right, let's take a text question from Peter in Birmingham. He says, after Putin met China's top diplomat today, how frightened should we be that Russia and China seem to be getting closer and closer? Now, this is Wang Yi of China's Central Foreign Affairs Commission. He's not the Foreign Secretary, though, I don't think, but he did meet our Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, last weekend. Cindy. Um, China doesn't actually have a foreign secretary. Oh, yeah, because 
the, the president does so much mm. himself. Um, so Wan Yi used to be the top foreign minister man, but he's kind of on his way out and we've got Ching Gang coming in as well. Um, but I think, you know, the gist of the question is how concerned should we be? I mean, I don't really think we should be frightened per se, but concerned, I think we should be watching it very, very carefully in terms of, you know, China is a huge military power. It's a, it's a nuclear power. Um, over the last year, it hasn't really got involved in the war. It has rhetorically criticised the West and America, but it really hasn't done anything material. Now, Antony Blinken from the US side last weekend warned that China was thinking about giving ammunition to Russia. And I think that would be quite a bad thing for Beijing to do from a strategic point of view, because it would unite the West even more. It would escalate the situation to a world war um, level. Um, and I'm not really sure what would be in it for them, considering they're already getting the cheap oil that they want. They're already getting, you know, Russia increasingly reliant on Chinese friendship, um, whilst less heat is on Taiwan. So I'm not really sure that they will go down that route. But if they were to do that, I think we we should be concerned. Well, there's a bit of a paradox here, isn't there? Because the West is arming Ukraine to the hill. Since I can't really turn around and say to China, well, um, if you do this, there'll be severe consequences. Well, Ian, if one you were here, he would tell you that double standards is no first, no first thing for the West to be <laughs> engaging in. You know, you're right. I mean, the, the West is seeing the Ukrainian war as a proxy war. Um, it is a fight between the West and authoritarianism or one between Russia and China. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, we've got to pick, pick sides, I think, for your average, you know, person. Um, and so you might not, you still probably wouldn't want Russia and China to win. But I, I think, I think, Understanding more where Moscow and Beijing are coming from can only be a good thing in this circumstance. Not because you necessarily agree with them, but understanding where they're coming from, I think, is really, really important. I agree with you, but Andrew Marr did a long interview with the Russian ambassador today, and um, I'm sure there'll be people think, well, how can you possibly interview a Russian ambassador in, the, in this kind of situation? You must. But you must get this as well. When you're trying to explain things about China, do people sort of have a bit of a go at you for sort of saying, well, she must be a China apologist? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wrote a column about this in The Spectator I've last year, actually. Yeah, that's probably yeah, well, why saying, I asked the question. <laughs> saying that I would be the perfect Chinese show, you know, listen to my accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the heart of the British establishment media. You know, I'm on this panel tonight. Um, and I say, well, what does Beijing think? And why does it think that? And what is the context for that? And, you know, I do get a lot of sometimes casually racist comments about why I would be doing yeah. something like that. But, you know, even in the Cold War, we had hotlines between yeah. Moscow and Washington. To just say that we couldn't even talk to them <coughs> would be crazy. I mean, you can't nuke them out of this world. They're gonna, you're going to have to coexist with them at some point. Right, Stephen Hammond, are you worried about this development? Yes, I am, but let's start. I don't think this is double standards by the West. Uh, I don't remember Ukraine invading Russia. Um, the reason why the West is helping Ukraine is that otherwise they would have been <coughs> taken over one sovereign state, taking over another, uh, and power and aggression. We... Um, forcing uh, a one sovereign state to be taken over and to lose all of its rights. And what we're effectively saying by supporting Ukraine is that the West and the, and the wider uh, democratic world does not think that authoritarianism should be able to march in. So I don't buy the double standards argument to the first point. But I absolutely agree with Cindy's last point, which is that, yes, of course we should be considered. Yes, of course we should um, be aware of the potential but the reality that sides don't talk, we were talking about Northern Ireland earlier on, mm. uh, and we know now that throughout a lot of the troubles there were lines of communication open. And therefore the idea that we're suddenly just going to say no one must talk to these things and because, you know, who knows what um, the developments may be and if we're not talking to people. And also what we want to do is surely to sponsor talk so that we can actually stop war. Uh, and uh, if we cut off that line of, uh, line of possibility... The final point I'd say is that, yes, of course we're watching that, and yes, of course I'm concerned, because one of the reasons that I think the West is is being so clear about why we are helping the Ukrainians and supporting the Ukrainians is that if the Russians were to win, that would potentially have ramifications elsewhere in the world. Uh, and therefore, quite rightly, we are also um, saying we recognise not only the interests of the Ukrainian people, but we recognise the wider principle and why that is not a good principle for peace in the world. Sure, yeah. I think what's happened is quite sobering for a number of reasons, some of which the panellists have talked about, but one of them is it, it's sobering for us 
to be reminded that this is not a UK-centric world anymore. And actually, there are other things happening around the world and power shifting and people having relationships. And we are not, as the UK, in the centre of that. You know, China has been developing relationships across other parts of the world, particularly across Africa, for many years. I have extended family. When you say relationships, you mean an empire? Relationships, empire, investment, trade. I mean, that that's a whole conversation about what is empire and what are those relationships. But that has been happening. And I think, you know, when, when we, we talk about meetings like this, it becomes very upfront and centre that actually this is going on in the world and we are not at the centre of it as we were perhaps 100 years ago. And those relationships have been building and, and powers have been shifting. So I think it's a good moment for us to think about, you know, what is our place in the world and how do we maintain that balance of power in our, our position? I was actually really struck um, on the, the meetings that uh, Wang Yi held with different foreign ministers throughout Europe. And all of the write-ups of these over the weekend didn't mention Britain at all. They mm. mentioned Italy, mm. France yeah. and Germany. And that's actually, I think, quite worrying, John Trickett. Well, yeah, I mean, as a patriot, you would like to think that uh, the wisdom of the British <coughs> would prevail. But let me just be discussed. Oh, you can discuss. But let me just make a slightly more uh, prosaic point, uh, which is that we shouldn't act as though China is our enemy. <clears throat> when they were in, they've been uh, into a number of European capitals. You've just said that, including um, in Moscow, which is a European capital. And it's interesting to see what they said. They called for peace in Moscow. Now, we can be cynical about the actions of nation states and presidents and, and, and statesmen and all the rest of it. I think we should take them, uh, try to hold them to their word. Clearly, at the end of the day, Stephen said it, there will be talks, there will be some sort of peace process at some point or another. And we don't need to push Russia and China into the same camp, if it's possible, to open up by process of diplomacy and other things. China said today that they were looking to build a coalition for peace across the countries of the world. Well, we could be cynical about what the Chinese have said, uh, but it's an interesting it's an interesting that they said in Moscow, though in the end, I think it's the United Nations who, which has to uh, try to lead with any diplomatic initiatives. And my final point is this, you know, they, the United Nations managed to open the grain ports in Ukraine and in conversations with Moscow, Ukraine, other European capitals, I think the Chinese might have been involved, and that was a good thing. So diplomacy produced, it hasn't ended the war, the war and it was a horrible, awful thing, uh, we accept all of that, but I think diplomacy does have a role to play and understanding the motions which direct different nations is part of okay. all of that. Right, final fun question from Jordan in Harlington. Scientists say more than a third of domestic jobs could be done by robots within a decade. Which task are you desperate for the robots to take over from you first? Um, Cindy? Um, probably hanging up the washing. Right. I find it the Chilina. most tedious task. Clean the kitchen. Yeah, the oven. <laughs> Don't want to do I've that seen the state end. of your oven. I've seen yours. <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> Ironing my shirts. <laughs> Did you have someone to do that for you? Of course not. It's called me. <laughs> John? Well, washing the pots and cleaning the kitchen is something I tend to put off for several days and then I'm disgusted with myself. I'm several sorry. days? Confession time. Confession time. But I do do it in the end, you know. Well, that's... that's Come arrive on a Monday. That's a relief and, to us yeah, all. You'll be glad to hear. Uh, it's a moot question. All of us are going to be unemployed anyway. Well, quite. Right. John, Cindy, <laughs> Shalina just think what we do with Stephen, our leisure time. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We're coming up in the next hour. We're going to talk about marriage because the number of people who've never been married or been in a civil partnership has continued to rise over the past decade. Uh, in 2021, 37.9% of adults, 18.4 million, had never been married or in a civil partnership. That's up from 34.6%, 15.7 million in 2011, 30% in uh, 20, 2001 and 26% in 1991. Why have we fallen out of love with marriage? Isn't marriage as an institution a good thing uh, why is it that fewer and fewer people see marriage as something important to their lives interested to get your views on that over the next hour 0345 6060 973 on your radio on global player and play lbc leading britain's conversation this is lbc 
From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, Shamima Begum's lawyers say they'll appeal after failing to overturn the removal of her British citizenship. She says she was trafficked when she left London at the age of 15 for Islamic State-controlled Syria. Labour MP John Trickett has told Cross Question the government's decision will likely cause some concern, though. It does beg the question, are we sending a signal to people all over our country that their citizenship can be revoked without an adequate explanation, at least through the courts? We have to trust the judge. The judge would have seen all the evidence, and I guess, I guess that they've taken a balanced view. The Home Office decided she was a threat in 2019. An independent review has been ordered into the way Lancashire Police investigated the disappearance of Nicola Bully. The Crime Commissioner says there are concerns about the force's search operation and how it communicated information. 